This presentation is not scripted, so I hope you don't mind it jumping around. Apparently that's the way I do things. It's going to be similar to the Stanley Meyer series in that I'm trying to unearth a little-known secret that I have a hunch as to a missing piece of information as to how Nikola Tesla managed to power his purported Pierce Arrow electric car in 1933, 1934, we're not quite sure when. There are two stories uh, floating around, one by Gary Vassilatos and one by Arthur Matthews relayed to Mark McKay. And I'm going to blend these two stories where I can, but for the m most part I'm going to fill it in substantiated by Peter Lindemann's analysis of one of Nikola Tesla's accomplishments in which he patented, in which he uses the sun as a source of energy on a plate, which is grounded, and in between the ground and the plate there is a capacitor, I believe, and the capacitor has a parallel shunt to a impulse-driven motor or any kind of impulse-driven device since the capacitor will take time to charge and, di and then discharge as it's soaking up energy from this one wire connection to the sun which is grounded to the earth as the other end of the capacitor or condenser in the old style of the word. So the plate is acting as a capacitor in the old side of the style of the word and the condenser is what our current capacitor is namely two-sided, two nodes, positive and negative, while the plate is one, and the earth is the other, actually. So the plate and the earth are extensions of the condenser, so I, I should correct me, uh, I'm correct myself. It's a, it's a regular condenser situation. Now, in a car, if you want this kind of radiant energy situation, you've got to, use, you've got to take your energy with you as you go, and it's got to be a little more powerful than the size of the plate. Then you can that you can afford. To, I mean, you can't spread it out on your roof, for instance, because you don't have a home. You can't spread it out on the top of the car. You have to chop it up and pack them together with the spaces in between. That's normally the way a battery might work. But in this case, I don't believe it was a battery. I believe it was a radioactive device emitting radioactive energy embedded in a clay matrix in between zinc plates. The zinc plates would corrode not because of the uh, radioactivity hitting them, but because of the compounds in the clay corroding the plates over time, and they would have to be replaced. Um, the clay would also have to be replaced and can, could easily have been found in that time period. You can't find it anymore. But in the 20s and 30s, it was very popular to buy mud packs or clays or go to treatment centers, spas, to get treated by clay that which had embedded in it at the very least radium chloride, excuse me, radium bromide, and then in addition to that there might be some thorium chloride, both of which are radioactive and both of which are halogen salts, the chloride and the bromide, which of course would wear down any metallic object in contact with them, in this case zinc plates. So we have ourselves a primary battery, but it's not an electrical battery, it's a radioactive emitting device. So this substantiates the Arthur Matthews story relayed to Mark McKay in which batteries, primary batteries with zinc plates, easy enough that a, a child could swap out the plates in five minutes and enough pl plates stacked in the trunk to last a year because there's a missing ingredient, the clay, or the matrix between the plates, the other node, the source of the energy in the first place. And in this sense, it's really a one-sided condenser, namely a capacitor in the old sense of the word, pre-stored energy in the form of radioactive uh, degradation of the thorium and radium. Um, so this validates that story, and the story uh, has different versions I noticed on the internet. It either is a 300-mile range before swapping out plates or a 500-mile range. And the clay you could get in any pharmacy walk into any pharmacy of the 20s and the 30s and get your uh, clay, radium into, uh, matrixed clay. Now that's not much. Uh, it's in the microcuries, but maybe that's all you need given uh, Tesla's wizardry of efficiency. 
um, I don't know. I'd leave it up to you. Otherwise, you'd have to add more radium, and that would be more trouble. And it wouldn't be easy and convenient. So I think Tesla made it convenient in the time period in which he was working. So we have to get out of the box of thinking in our time period, namely it was an electrical battery, and instead get into their time box of thinking the way he would have thought in that time span. And how could it have happened except that I started making use of edible clays, and then I realized that a metal hydride battery, a hi the hydride part, is similar to the swelling edible clays, the type of edible clays that swell when you hydrate them. Hydrate them. And so consequently, I just swapped out nickel plates in, in place of the nickel plates of my nickel metal hydride battery in my RAV4 EV2002, and then replaced the hydride gel with an edible clay gel. And then it dawned on me, well, it, no, I didn't dawn on me, I ran across this article. I was looking up clays of the 20s and 30s thinking, okay, you'd have to replenish that. So wh what kind of clay was popular in the 20s and 30s? Where would you get it from and what was it called? And then I stumbled on these advertisements, a whole web page devoted to these advertisements of various uses of radioactive clay popular in that time period. And that was the solution. I literally stumbled across it. I didn't really know what to look for. I just knew clay was what to look for in that time period. So I googled t uh, what clay was popular among women, uh, cosmetic clay, in the 1930s. And that's when I stumbled across this. So I think it's a find worth worthy of consideration because Peter Lindemann spent a heck of a lot of time in his book, Secrets of Cold Electricity, and um, that you can get on his website or elsewhere possibly, I believe. And he also did a vid uh, presentation, I think, at the University of Irvine, if I'm not mistaken, back in the within the first decade of this millennium, somewhere uh, between 2000 and 2010. Um, let's just say 2005. Uh, might have been 2006. And it was an hour long, I believe, presentation. And he goes, he highlights all kinds of things from the book. And one of the highlights is this radiant use of picking up power on a pl single plate, which I just had already described. It's a patent. It's already been patented. So all uh, Tesla had to do was scale down his Wardenclyffe Tower operation of one wireless electricity uh, transmission of power to a portable unit that could be carried around inside a car namely radioactive um, production of energy picked up by the zinc plates and then carried through the circuitry. Now I don't know what is considered ground in that circuit, maybe the chassis of the car I would imagine, uh, common ground unfortunately, but um, maybe the antenna served as a further extension of that grounding process, grounding to the atmosphere. There was supposedly, a, in Gary Vassilatos' version of the story, there was a six-foot antenna attached to the car. That's a heck of an antenna. And that might be the capacitive grounding to the air, in the old style of the word capacitor, not our current version.